So the average person spends 36% of their life asleep. Now, this may sound like a lot, but way too many of us have insufficient sleep and poor quality sleep every single night. And this is just like leading to a whole heap of negative consequences for our physical health, mental health, and our overall feeling of well-being. So let's dive into how we can optimize our sleeping habits. Now, most people see sleep as a huge waste of time, but getting good quality sleep plays a huge role in maintaining and improving our mental and physical health. Firstly, it has a restorative function. So during the day, our brain is using like a bunch of energy and nutrients to support its intricate network of neurons, resulting in this buildup of metabolic waste. And so when we're asleep, we have this system called the glymphatic system that comes in, cleans out all this waste, and helps us to feel like refreshed and rejuvenated for the new day. Secondly, sleep helps with memory consolidation. Basically, new information and experiences are transferred from our short-term memory to our long-term memory when we're asleep. So if we don't get enough sleep, then we can't take advantage of those processes that help to organize, solidify, and strengthen those experiences that we form throughout the day. Finally, our brain plays a huge role in improving metabolic functions as we sleep. For example, sleep helps us to maintain hormone levels like insulin at their optimal levels, which controls our blood sugar. It helps us to repair tissues like muscles and organs, and it also helps us to reduce stress by lowering our levels of cortisol in the body. So now we know why we should sleep. Now let's look at what a great night's sleep looks like. And to do this, we need to look at the two process model of sleep regulation and the sleep cycle. The two process model of sleep regulation is an idea first proposed by Dr. Alexander Borbley, which explains how our sleep and wake cycles are controlled. So the first process is called sleep pressure. Basically throughout the day, our desire to go to sleep increases, i.e. our sleep pressure increases, and this is driven by a chemical called adenosine. So when we go to sleep, our adenosine levels are at its highest, and therefore we naturally feel inclined and we have this desire to fall asleep. But then when we wake up in the morning, our adenosine levels are depleted, and therefore we feel awake and we have no desire to go to sleep. The second process then is known as wake dry. So within our body, there's this like 24 hour body clock controlled by something known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus that helps us to feel awake and tired at regular intervals throughout the day. And this is more commonly known as our circadian rhythm. Interestingly, all of our circadian rhythms are slightly different. So some of us are more inclined to wait, stay awake late at night. Some of us are more inclined to wake up early in the morning. And all of this is driven by genetics. So if we want to improve our sleep, essentially what we want to do is we want to get the balance and rhythm correct between our natural fluctuations in our adenosine levels and our natural circadian rhythm, such that our sleep pressure is at its greatest when we're supposed to fall asleep. More on this in a bit. So the second thing I mentioned was the sleep cycle. And the sleep cycle plays a huge role in the quality of our sleep itself. And there are essentially two parts of the sleep cycle we need to know about. Firstly, there is non-rapid eye movement sleep, and this is a period of deep sleep where our brain is undergoing critical repairs and growth processes. And then secondly, there is a more active form of sleep known as rapid eye movement sleep, and this is where our brain undergoes some amount of mental rejuvenation, it's clearing out irrelevant information, it's strengthening memories, it's helping us to learn, and it's sort of building up those neural pathways and connections. Throughout the night, we cycle between these two different types of sleep, and it's the kind of gentle rhythm between non-rapid eye movement and rapid rapid eye movement that ensures we have a good quality night's sleep. Any disruption to the rhythm or the timing of these phases can lead to sleep disorders or other health issues. But luckily, there are things that we can do to maintain a consistent sleep cycle, improve and control our circadian rhythm, and ensure that we have a good quality night's sleep. I call these things the REM factors, which stand for routine, environment, and meals. The best way to maintain a consistent sleep cycle is to develop a consistent sleep routine. And this means going to sleep and waking up at roughly the same time. You see, as creatures of habit, we thrive on consistency. So if we have like an irregular sleep schedule, this is going to completely throw off our circadian rhythm, having a negative effect on our mood, our mental health, our productivity, and overall health. So when should we be going to sleep and how long should we be sleeping for? The exact time we should go to sleep won't be the same for everyone. You see, we all have slightly different chronotypes which influence when we feel tired throughout the day. Like some of us are gonna have a more natural inclination to want to go to sleep later, some are gonna have the inclination to go to sleep earlier. And the most important thing we can do is to understand our natural inclination as to when we want to sleep and work with that rather than against it. But having said that, there are some studies that do suggest that there is in fact an optimal time to sleep. In fact, one study found that we get the most beneficial sort of hormonal secretion and recovery and rejuvenation when we sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. But if you do struggle with sleeping at that time, don't worry. Like the most important things are to have a consistent sleep schedule and also sleeping enough hours. 
So then, what is the correct number of hours we should be sleeping every single night? Now, to answer this question, let's take a look at this study from the University of Pennsylvania, which gathered a group of 48 men and women who averaged around seven or eight hours of sleep per night. And they split these people up into four separate groups. The first group had to stay up for three days straight. The second group could sleep for four hours a night. The third group could sleep for six hours a night. And the fourth group could sleep for eight hours every single night. And the four hour, six hour and eight hour group were studied across a two week time period. And essentially they measured all these groups on various different physical and mental performance tests throughout the experimental phase. Here's what happened. So the group that were allowed to sleep for eight hours a night experienced no motor skill decreases, no cognitive declines, or no attention lapses either. But all the other groups gradually experienced increasingly worse performance, both mentally and physically, throughout the study. In particular, there were two key findings. Firstly, sleep debt is cumulative. So it's like taking an overdraft on a bank account that just keeps growing. In fact, after just one week, 25% of the six hour per night sleepers found that they were nodding off at random points throughout the day. And after two weeks, their mental and physical performance was as bad as if they'd stayed up for two days straight. Secondly, participants didn't even notice their own performance decline. When they measured their own performance, they essentially thought that it dropped slightly to begin with before tapering and leveling off throughout the study. When in fact, what was really happening was their performance gradually declined every single day throughout the study. So the key takeaway then is that we probably all need a lot more sleep than we think. And according to a wide range of studies, around 95% of adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep per night. The next most important factor to improve our quality of sleep is to control our environment. In particular, we need to think about light and temperature. Firstly, light. Now, one of the best things that we can do to maintain a healthy and consistent circadian rhythm is to expose ourselves to bright sunlight first thing in the morning and bright light throughout the day. In fact, experts suggest that we should get around 20 to 30 minutes of natural sunlight into our eyes as soon as we can after we first wake up. And the idea is that it helps us to regulate our internal body clock, helping us to feel more energetic throughout the day and also to sleep better at night. Light viewing early in the day is the most powerful stimulus for wakefulness throughout the day, and it has a powerful positive impact on your ability to fall and stay asleep at night. The mechanism behind the positive effects on our sleep here lies in the way that light affects a suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. Essentially, as the sun sets and the world becomes darker, the pineal gland is prompted to release melatonin, which helps us to feel more sleepy. But artificial lights can disrupt this natural process, which is why we really want to avoid laptops or iPads or phones or basically any screen emitting blue light just before we go to sleep. In fact, in one study sponsored by a mobile phone company, they found that using a mobile phone before you go to sleep will one, meaning it will take longer for you to enter into deep sleep, and two, mean that once you eventually get to deep sleep, you'll spend less time in that deep sleep too. And this means that your body has less time to repair and regrow, it will lead to depressed immune function, depressed hormonal function, and also lower performance the next day. So if possible, we should turn off all of our devices about 90 minutes before we go to sleep. Or if that's really not possible, then we should try to do everything we can to block all the blue light, as blue light is the biggest culprit when it comes to inhibiting melatonin production, which is why I wear these blue light blocking glasses. The second consideration is temperature. So our natural inclination when it's time to go to sleep is for our core body temperature to drop. So throughout the day, we have like this natural circadian rhythm of our temperature, where during the night, our body temperature is at its lowest and during the day, it's at its highest. But modern living has completely changed this dynamic. Basically, these sort of blankets and thermostats and radiators and pajamas have standardized our temperatures and disrupted the natural fluctuation in our temperature throughout the day, and therefore really confused our circadian rhythm too. So to control this, we want to manipulate our body temperature to control sleep. In particular, we want to make our room and our body as cold as possible before we go to sleep at night to kind of align with the natural drop in temperature that our body will expect from a healthy circadian rhythm of our temperature. And one way that we could do this is to have a hot bath or hot shower before we go to bed. While that may sound super like counterintuitive, this like the really rapid cooler period once you step out of the shower or bath helps us to feel very sleepy. Or you can splash water on your face, or you could open a window, or you could just take off some clothes. Basically anything you can do to make yourself feel cooler before you go to bed is going to make you sleep better. Finally we have meals, or perhaps more accurately, nutrition. So the timing, size and content of our meals can play a huge role in the quality of our sleep. In particular if we eat too late at night that can inhibit the release of certain hormones like the human growth hormone and melatonin which can impact things like our sleep weight cycle and also our body's ability to repair itself. Large meals or beverages consumed close to bedtime can also lead to problems like indigestion, which also disrupts our sleep. 
But not all late night eating is problematic. Like, in fact, there are some studies that suggest that a healthy light snack just before you go to bed may actually improve the quality of your sleep. Perhaps a slightly bigger risk to a good night's sleep is the consumption of caffeine and alcohol. Caffeine found in beverages like coffee and Cokes and certain teas works by blocking the process of adenosine, making us feel super awake at night. So if we drink something like coffee in the late afternoon or evening, the effects of that can linger for up to eight to 10 hours, which may make it really, really hard for us to fall asleep at night. In fact, in one study of the impact on caffeine on sleep, found that consuming caffeine up to six hours before you go to bed can lead to a loss of one hour of sleep that night, an effect not often consciously recognized by that person sleeping. Alcohol is also a really bad thing to drink just before you go to sleep. Now, some people mistakenly believe that alcohol isn't so bad due to its sedative effects, but while it makes us fall asleep, faster, it severely impacts the quality of our sleep. For example, REM sleep, which is critical for memory consolidation and learning, is completely disrupted. There's also increases in sleep apnea, which is where we temporarily stop breathing, increases when we drink alcohol before we go to sleep, and also it impacts the production of melatonin and the human growth hormone, which disrupts our internal body clock and internal repair processes. So the long and short of it is essentially try to stick to healthy eating and drinking habits before you go to sleep and try not to consume too much before bedtime. There's actually like a ton of science on all of this stuff that's just way too detailed to cover in this YouTube video. So if you want to find out more about any of this stuff, I've written a super in-depth article below this video. So do make sure you check it out if you're interested.